the Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you this morning, Father. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Well, God bless you this morning, church. May we stand. Amen. Praise God. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. There's no greater privilege than to be in his presence. Amen. And so this morning, we just, we're here just to worship him. So whatever, whatever things are happening, whatever you've gone through the week, whatever happened on your way here, just leave it, put it at his feet, and let's just focus on him this morning. Amen. We welcome you this morning once again, not just for another service, but for uh, the worship of our God. Amen. We didn't, we're not here just because as a routine, we're not here just because we thought it was a good idea. We're here because we want to praise him and we want to worship him and we want to seek him. Um, I want you to open the, uh, your Bibles to Psalms 40. We're going to read five verses out of that Psalm. Psalm 40, verse 1 through 5. Salmos 40, del 1 al 5. Gloria a Dios. Poderoso Jesús, we bless you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are. Amen. And the word of God reads as follows. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a, a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet up on a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Amen. How many, how many of you have a new song in your mouth? How many of you can sing to the Lord of, uh, just, just a song from your heart? Amen. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to God. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O oh Lord my God, are, are your wonderful works, which you have done. And your thought towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. Praise the Lord. If you've ever tried to count the blessings of God in your life, I'm sure that you've ran out of number and you've ran out of time. Amen. There's no way for us to remember from the minute that he came into our hearts, how many blessings, how many, how much he's done for us. And so this morning, let's be reminded that we are here, not because of our own strength, but because of his amen, because he's with us. Father, we bless you and we magnify you this morning. We thank you, Father, for Lord, your blessings, your immeasurable, uncountable blessings upon our lives, for your strength, Father, for all that you do, Lord. Father, we pray that this morning you would be in this place, Lord, that your presence, God, would permeate every heart and every mind. Father, that you would bless everything from this opening prayer, God, through the worship, Father, that you would speak through your word, God, to those that are just eager to hear your voice, Father. Lord, speak to each and every one of your children this morning so that we would be able, Lord, to be strengthened, God, for our daily walk. Father, I pray for those at home that you would also, Lord, in that place where they are, Father, you would just fill that room, Father, with your presence. We praise you, we magnify you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody give a praise. Come on, is it okay we worship the Lord here this morning? Come on, thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. How many of you know today was not promised, but today we get to give the Lord thanks and give him praise. Come on, would you worship him with me? this morning. Come on. God bless you. How I many know it's okay to dance for the Lord here this morning? 
Jump 
How many of you are thankful for the Holy Spirit today? Thank you for your indwelling spirit, God. I've been reading a devotional about the persecuted church and said this morning as I was reading, I was talking about the first evidence of the Holy Spirit was that he drew the apostles, he drew the disciples to be devoted to worship, to be devoted to the word, to be devoted to the place of prayer. So we're going to draw on the Holy Spirit within us this morning. We're going to draw on his strength because there are things to pray about. We have a lot to pray about, church. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you'll pray through us this morning. Give us your words. Give us your petitions. Jesus, you're the great intercessor. You're the great intercessor, so let your spirit in us cry out for the things that you want, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We have prayer this morning for... A young man named Rob Neal, his family, he was in an accident that was fatal. He was a friend of Brother Robert's, had just gotten engaged, lost his life, and his family is no doubt grieving greatly for such a tragic loss. So we want to pray for their peace and their strength. I don't know if they're saved, but we're going to pray that they will be. <laughs> if they're not, that the Comforter will, will comfort them. We want to pray for Brother Louis's family as they're still grieving the loss of Sister Laura. We want to pray for their children to be saved, for those parents' prayers to be answered. We want to pray for Sister Rena, who is still in the hospital. Pray for her family, because they are also going through loss. We want to pray for Brother Tony and Sister Rosa, friends of Pastor John and Cindy. Um, they've lost two family members. Brother Tony is um, in a recovering facility, but he's not home yet. So we want to continue to pray that God will restore him. 
want to pray for Sister Aura, who is also home, but her son Isaac is still in the hospital, still in need of prayer, still sedated. We are warring for him to come back. <clears throat> we also want to pray for, there are still 16 fires burning. Three times the amount of land has been burned since last fire season, and our firefighters are weary, and many have been displaced from their homes. They need our prayers. We want to pray for, <clears throat> there have been, this is now the third, or the third or fourth, I think it's the fourth hurricane that we're on. So there's a lot brewing and there are a lot of people suffering. We want to pray for those families. We want to pray for those who are enduring the atrocities taking place in Afghanistan, for the military families, for those who are refugees and suffering greatly. We want to pray for Cuba. Many of them are still trying to escape, fleeing, being detained and sent back. And they'll be either sent to prison or they'll be punished severely so we need to pray for that land and those people as well I want to pray for the many who are still suffering from COVID and losing family members from COVID we need to intercede church we also have some other um, prayer requests from people in the congregation sister Maria um, is asking for for prayer for her mother for salvation that she would come to know Christ and also that her body would be healed from cancer that we're asking that they, God would sustain the family and give them strength as they contend for their mother's healing and their faith. And I love it because the sister came to me this morning with so much faith. This is what I want God to do. Church, this is a good place to bring our needs before the throne of God. Also praying for our sister Maria for healing in her body and that God would grant her favor as she seeks the help that she needs from the doctors and from the state. She's not able to work right now. We're praying for complete health for her so she can be the mother and the grandmother that God wants her to be. Praying for her grand, Sylvia's grandson uh, has a rash for over a month and he's been to the doctor repeatedly. They can't find a reason, but he's a little guy and he's got a rash that won't go away, but we know a God who can heal. So let's pray for that. And then finally, uh, Rita's granddaughter uh, is in prison and not supposed to be released for another year, but she has children at home waiting for her. So we wanna pray that God will do a miracle in her heart, in her mind, in her life, and bring her home to be the mom that she can be to her kids. And we wanna, of course, keep covering the children because they're, they're gonna with, uh, withstand a lot, this generation will. Let's go before the Lord. We also, also have a prayer request, so I do wanna enter in with that. I'm um, Gladys Maher and her husband who are here today. It's their 41st wedding anniversary. Praise the Lord for his faithfulness to your marriage and for your example. Thank you, Lord. God, you are so faithful and you are good. And we come in, Lord, acknowledging your goodness. Though we're battered by troubles on all sides, God, yet you remain faithful. You remain the one, God, that we can turn to in our times of need. You told us not to let our hearts be troubled, God, but to believe in you. You told us, God, to call upon your name, to ask and keep on asking, to knock and keep on knocking and seek and keep on seeking. So God, we are here. We're asking for justice, Lord. We're asking for healing, God. We're asking for you to interrupt the catastrophes that are on the horizon for so many. We're asking, God, for you to give strength to the weary. We're asking you to send forth your word and heal those who are stricken in body, whether it be from COVID or the complications of COVID, whether it be from cancer, or God, whether it be from pain or arthritis or diabetes, Lord, whatever it is, there is nothing too great for you, God. We're asking for healing of the mind and the heart, God, for healing of the soul as we prepare to enter into your invitation for healing, God, a season of preparation for your bride. Lord, we know that there is no hurt you are not able to heal, no trauma you are not able to bring restoration from. God, we ask that from the smallest to the greatest need, God, from the deepest to even the most sliver of pain in your people's lives, God, that you would move, that you would be the father and the shepherd that you have promised us you would be. Lord, we look to you. You are the God from whence comes our help. We don't look to the right or to the left, God. There's no other place we can put our hope, God. We pray. We thank you for the doctors and the nurses, but our hope is not in them, God. We thank you for what they're doing, but we ask that you would supernaturally, God, affect their ministry, affect their work to touch your people, to help your people, to heal your people, God. 
For those who are grieving, Lord, we pray the comfort of your spirit would wrap around them, Lord, in their hour of need. We pray for the body of Christ to be mobilized in every direction, God, to help the hurting, to help the suffering. God, don't let us sit at home and be detached from their pain and their suffering. God, put us into motion. Show us how to serve. Show us what we can do, God. Put us into action. Cause your spirit, God, to stir up our hearts with a burden so strong that it won't relent so that we can organize God and we can send help. Lord, if we can't go in person, we can pray together. We can send resources together, God. I pray, Lord, that you will cause us to re realize, to recognize, to remember the authority that you've entrusted us with, God. Help us to faithfully pray, Holy Spirit. Help us to agree with you, God. Lord, be with our firefighters, be with the refugees that are fleeing, be with the families, God, that are enduring so much suffering and persecution, be with the ones who are standing in defense, God, of those who cannot defend themselves and bring a wave of encouragement and strength. Be with the persecuted church, God. Let your witness arise boldly in their hearts, God. Let their songs ring out. Give them supernatural grace and love, God, so that those who are persecuting them will see you and know that you are real and not only that God but their hearts will be penetrated by your love for them God we thank you for their witness Lord of the persecuted church we thank you God that they're not praying for themselves they're praying for those who are coming against them God Lord we join them in prayer we pray that you will be glorified we pray that your name will be lifted up and exalted in every nation God Lord, tend to our children in this hour. Lord, they're, they're under so much pressure, God. Lord, the, the atmosphere is raging with wickedness, God. So we sing out and we raise the banner of your name and of your love, God, and we declare truth, Lord, in the atmosphere. We call every son and daughter that's been created by you to realize their true identity. We stand in the gap, God, and we war for their souls, the soul of this generation, oh God. Do not let them be lost, Lord. Do not let them be devoured by the enemy, God. Send forth your warring angels, God. Lift up a standard against the enemy, God, who comes against the children of this generation. Raise up Christians in every realm, in every sphere of society to influence God. Children with your love and with your truth, God. Raise up mighty warriors who will speak the truth, God. Who will guide them, who will stand in prayer, God. Who will intercede in their classrooms, God. Turn this generation back to you, Lord. Raise them up to be able to endure what they must stand through, oh God. We cannot do it without you, but with you, God, there is nothing impossible. There is nothing impossible, God. Lord, we thank you. We praise you and we give you all glory in Jesus' name. Right there where you are, just lift your hands. He's worthy of it all praise. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. We give you glory, we give you praise, Jesus. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. Oh, oh we give you glory. And no.
Can you sing that with me in church this morning? You're worthy, you are worthy of it all. Sing, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. All the saints and angels. And all the saints and angels bow before your throne. And all the elders cast the crown before.
we sing that church? Sing to worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Oh. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Moses sought to free his people, he asked for permission to take them out, to lead them out of slavery so they could worship God. We've been set free to worship, church. Worship is not just singing to the Lord, it's the orientation of your whole life around one thing, one person. We do everything in him and for him and through him. We used to sing that song, Jesus be the center of it all. You put your hand on your heart and say, Jesus, be the center of my life. Lead me, Holy Spirit, in worshiping Jesus alone. Let every other God fall. Church, it's good news that we've been set free to worship. It means you don't have to serve anything else. You don't have to serve a lie. You don't have to serve the enemy. You don't have to serve your flesh. We serve Jesus. We worship Jesus, the one who brings sweet liberty, the one who brings joy, the one who brings peace, the one who makes it possible for us to walk in truth. We've been set free to worship. Thank you for your freedom, Lord. We love you, God. We honor you. We thank you so much for your spirit. We unite in one spirit today, Lord. We ask that you give us ears to hear in your spirit today. We ask that you do what you set out to do in all of us today. Liberate the oppressed, God, those who are in bondage. Bring hope, God, to those whose hearts are failing. Bring healing, Lord. Be God in this place. Be God in this place. Whatever you want to do, God, just be who you are. Get past all our defenses, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray and give our thanks. Amen. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion in a few moments. But before we do, if you do not have elements for communion, please raise your hand and, and we'll make sure that someone brings them to you. We are also going to prepare our hearts to worship through giving. I love that in, in parts of scripture, we're told not to test the Lord. But when it comes to giving, that's the one place we're told to test the Lord our God and see if what he's promised he will not do. And so I want to um, I want to lovingly challenge you to give to God this morning from a generous heart, from a fearless heart. If you feel afraid that you're not going to have enough, ask God to take that fear from you. Bring it into his presence so that he can get rid of that, so he can break that bondage because he will always provide. So let's prepare our hearts um, and let's go before the Lord. God, I thank you that you are our provider. You are the good shepherd. You make sure all of our needs are met. You're a good father. Lord, we give to you today, not out of a feeling of lack, but out of the acknowledgement of your abundance. You've given more than enough, God, and we joyfully give back so that others can also know you, so that others can be reached, so that others can experience the overflow, God, that we've tasted. Help us never to be selfish, God, never to be fearful as your children, but to always give and to always trust that you'll make sure that we have everything we need. We so gladly into your kingdom and ask that you will multiply it, God, to meet every need. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. If you're in the house, you can give to the ushers when you leave. If you're giving online, you can text the word TDLC to the number 77977. You can also go online to tdlc.org there and you may give there at our website or through the My Church Giving app. There will be drop down buttons for tithe and offering. A um, couple of announcements as we prepare for uh, communion. Uh, uh, we have still ongoing Bible studies with Pastor Jackie, but not tomorrow. So one week from tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, and towards the end of this month, uh, Pastor John will be starting a, ser a sermon series on healing. It's going to be very powerful. Please now begin to prepare your heart. Ask God to put his finger on anything in you that, that he wants to heal. Let's come in hungry. Let's come in ready to receive. Amen. Uh, and then Bible study as usual on Wednesdays and also food pantry still needs help. There's, uh, they're giving food away on Wednesdays. If you can be here to help, we'd love it. And there will be more announcements on the slides afterward. Pastor John, ready to come up? Praise the Lord. God bless everybody. So, um, Pastor Chantel mentioned our food distribution. We actually, we really can use all the help we can get. Last Wednesday, we literally had a line from the gate all the way past the church. And so we had uh, probably 150 to 200 people. And so uh, it's a blessing and the Lord seemed to stretch the food we had. Nobody went away empty handed, but it definitely... Uh, is a lot of people to manage. And so the more people we have, and really we could use not just for physical labor, that part, but also spiritual. Like we don't have enough people because we're moving these people through. If we had extra people, we could, we'd could we have more time to pray with them and, and, and share the Lord with them. We, you know, we'd love on them the best we can. We pray with those that need prayer, but we'd love an opportunity to minister to all of them. And most of them are Spanish speaking. So any help, it'd be better to have more than less. Amen. So we'll find something uh, for everyone to do. So that's our chance. That's our chance and our opportunity to not just meet physical needs, but spiritual needs. Amen. So today, as we take communion, my thoughts are with the the persecuted church throughout the world. You heard Pastor Chantel uh, pray about Cuba, about Afghanistan, and as as we're here worshiping today, throughout the week, I've been thinking about uh, the church in Afghanistan. We've heard reports that as soon as America withdrew from Afghanistan, the Taliban started going door to door and looking for opposition and even looking for Christians. And there was Christians that were saying, please pray for us. And at first the reports were that God would hide us from them. 
And I understand that prayer, but then we started hearing reports that, th that many missionaries and Christians there that were still in Afghanistan, just as the Taliban started going door, door to door, the Spirit of God must have prompted them because then they said, you know what? We don't know how much time we have left. We're going to go door to door and we're going to start sharing Jesus with people because this is our last chance. And that many people were being saved as a result of this, I believe, Spirit-inspired uh, idea that they took upon themselves. And so in Cuba as well, the church is being persecuted. They're putting soldiers in front of the churches right now. Uh, they're, they're taking senior pastors to jail uh, because the church is saying, uh, we won't stand for immoral uh, teachings in our school systems and things like that. They're standing for biblical values. And so they're being persecuted and their churches are being uh, closed and things like that. And I shared testimony with you previously on those things. And so my thought is throughout the world today, brothers and sisters, churches, believers, around the world right now are taking communion together because no matter what denomination we are or non-denominational we are we are all we all have one thing in common we've all put our faith how, how we all put our faith in Jesus Christ the son of God who died on the cross for our sins who rose from the third day and ascended back to the right hand of the father where he lives to make intercession for us forevermore we all you know, you could be uh, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, non-denominational, Catholic, whatever. We all go back to that one place, that, that one place right there. We all start there. And we all put our faith in Jesus. And so that's why we take communion, so we could remember that. And it's such a beautiful thing because how we, how we manifest the different liturgy and things like that is not, not as important as that right there, the cross. And so we worship the Lord all from our hearts because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. So we share with our brothers and sisters across the globe today as we take communion. And so I want to ask you to take a moment and reflect on the cross. This is what Jesus told us to do. He would, let's reflect, let's take a moment and reflect on the fact that the Son of God left his glory, left heaven, and came to earth in the form of a servant as a man. He humbled himself to the point you couldn't get any lower than dying on a cross in Roman times. And he took that upon himself for us. And so he shed his blood for our salvation, for our healing, and that we might spend eternity with him all through that torturous instrument called a Roman cross. So let's take a moment to remember. And let's join in a spirit of unity, our brothers and sisters across the globe. We don't discuss our differences right now. We discuss what we have in common. And that's Jesus, the Son of God, dying on a cross for our sins. We remember that's what it all comes back to. It's where it all starts and ends for every one of us. Jesus, we remember, we remember, we remember, we remember, and it causes us to praise. It causes us to praise. It causes us to praise you as we remember Jesus what you did for us it demonstrates your love towards us it demonstrates your goodness your faithfulness we thank you just take a moment and thank him say thank you Jesus and Lord we remember the persecuted church we remember, Lord, the, the underground church in China, Lord. They can't even whisper because if they're heard, Lord, they'll be arrested and some even executed. Lord, we remember our brothers and sisters who suffer because of that cross, because of their faith. Forgive us, Lord, for the trivial reasons why we won't go to church, Lord. They, they go to church, they gather at risk of their lives, Lord. Please forgive us. We worship you, Lord. We worship you and we thank you. We remember the cross. We remember your shed blood. We remember what you endured for us, Jesus. And we worship and we glorify your name. 
You alone have redeemed us from our sins, Lord. You alone shed your blood. There's no other name under heaven by which man might be saved. It's through the name of Jesus, the resurrected son of the living God. We worship you and we join our brothers and sisters. We, we pray and we weep for the persecuted church. In China, Afghanistan, Cuba, and so many different parts of the world, Lord. Be with them. We know where sin abounds, grace abounds more. We know that your presence manifests gloriously in, the, in their midst, Lord. But be with them, we pray. Thank you, Jesus. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And he was, he was partaking of the Passover supper with them. The next day he would be on a cross paying for our sins. And that night they sung hymns, customary Passover hymns from the Psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. They worshiped that was customary for the Jews for the Passover celebration. But that celebration pointed towards him Everything in the Old Testament pointed towards him. And he, we are told by the Apostle Paul later, he is the Passover lamb. And so that night he gave meaning to that Passover meal and to what he was about to do. And the first thing he did is that night he took the bread. He took the bread that night. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The bread symbolizing his body. He broke it, he looked to heaven, and he gave thanks. And so today we take the bread, we look to heaven, and we say, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. So we take the bread in remembrance of him to take it together. Thank you, Lord. We remember your body, which was broken for us. Lord, if you had not died on that cross, if you had not shed your blood, we would not be here right now. We would be lost. There'd be no salvation. There'll be no eternity waiting for us. But you came and you died and you rose from the dead and you said you are the resurrection and the life and whoever believes in you shall not die but live. And we live because of your sacrifice, because of your death. So we remember Jesus and our hearts are filled with gratitude. If we've made our faith, if we've made our salvation, if we've made anything in regards to you and our worship of you about anything else other than the Son of God crucified and risen and ascended, please forgive us, Lord. We center ourselves by going back to the cross of Calvary where the Son of God died on a hill outside of Jerusalem. We thank you, Jesus. That same night, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Again, speaking prophetically, because he had not shed his blood yet. And we will be told by the prophet Isaiah, anticipating Jesus' death, he said, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, meaning his shed blood, we are healed. And that healed is a present tense in, in the Hebrew. And then later on in the Greek, it would be interpreted present, meaning it's not, he not just healed us once, but there's always healing available to us through his shed blood because there's power in the blood of Jesus to heal. There's healing in the atonement of Christ. And so we take the cup together, remembrance of his shed blood. Lord, we remember... We remember your shed blood and we give you praise and we give you thanks because there's power in your blood. There's salvation in your blood. There's healing in the blood of Jesus. What can take away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So Lord, we thank you and we remember your shed blood. Let's take a moment and lift our hands. Let's worship the Lord together as we remember our great Savior's love, sacrifice, and salvation and that I came through the cross. 
never know how much it cost to see my sins upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see just bless the Lord this is why we are here is to bless the Lord just to raise up holy hands just to just to just begin to just love on him just begin to thank him just begin to praise him just begin to give him glory that is why we are here to magnify God for who he is and for what he has done and what he is continually doing time after time after time this is the God that we are served this is the God that paid a price this is the God that knows you and I and this is why we have the freedom in this place to worship can we just just again just with voices out loud just begin to worship God just begin to thank him as only you can father we just keep you Oh my God, yes, 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 my God, may be seated amen yes he is worthy of the praise mm. think about this if it was not for God where would you and I be right now the life that we were living where would we be how we were in this world what we were doing where would we be if it was not for the wonderful magnificent sacrifice of love that he had for you. Amen. Praise God. Father, this morning what we ask is that you would have your way. From beginning to end, my God, may you have your way through your word. May our hearts be open and susceptible, Lord God, 
to hear what your spirit is saying, Lord God. Let it go forth in its power and authority. Begin that you would be magnified, that you would continue, my God, to direct us upon the path that you are calling us to walk, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We are so careful to give you the honor and the glory. We pray this, my God, in Jesus' most precious name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. We have all seen at one time or another someone who has gotten an award or has won the big game or has made a great contribution to this society. And as we see them, they are standing with the people cheering and clapping and a microphone is placed in front of them. Then we usually hear these words, I would like to thank. These individuals begin to give credit to and honor to those who have helped them succeed to get to this point in their life. Their mothers, fathers, siblings, grandparents, friends, teachers, bosses, mentors, and coaches, and sometimes even God. They evaluate their lives and remember those who have helped them, who have stood by them, cared for them, and watched over them. They want to take this time to publicly recognize them because they have personally recognized them. That without these people in their life's journey, they never would have made it. They knew the cost and remembered all that was done for them. Then we have those who are just the opposite, who have forgotten those who have helped them along the way. And I'd like to give you an example, a perfect example of this. We can see this in the movie Rocky V. Rocky trains a young man, Tommy Gunn, an underdog boxer, who under Rocky's training rises to the ranks and becomes a heavyweight champion. In the ring after the belt has been given, they interview him. With Rocky at home, he says, and this is Tommy, he says, I would like to thank the one who made this happen. I would like to thank the man who made me believe that this could happen. A man who has been like an angel on my shoulder. The next image we see is that of Rocky's face. And he has a smile of contentment on him. They once again go back to show Tommy. And he says this, I would like to thank, and there's a pause, Mr. George Duke, his promoter. They pan back to Rocky and where he once was, where there once was a smile on his face, and that all that could be seen was an expression of hurt and disappointment. Because Tommy had forgotten, he didn't even remember everything that Rocky had done for them. And in the same manner that Tommy did not remember what, God, what Rocky had done to him, Israel has treated God in the same manner. If you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Amos, chapter 2. Amos, the, uh, the book of Amos, Bible, chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. What we see here is Israel, God is presenting judgment upon Judah and Israel. In verse 4, God speaks to Judah and he says this. This is what the Lord says. The people of Judah have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They have rejected the instruction of the Lord, refusing to obey his decrees. They have been led astray by the same lies that deceived their ancestors. In verse 6, he begins to address Israel. He says this, that this is what the Lord says, that the people of Israel have sinned again and again. The people of Israel, they were living these lives with recklessness and abandonment. With no cares or worries as what they were doing. They did as they pleased. 
They have forgotten all that God had told them about the blessings and cursings of obeying his laws and commands. They even had forgotten all that God had done for them. In between verses 8 and 9, it seems as if God had stopped and thought in it himself. How did you allow yourselves to get to this point in your lives and in our relationship? How could you have forgotten about me? How could you have forgotten what I've done? So then in verse 9 and 10, God speaks with his heart as if he was saying, remember it was me. This is the title of my sermon. Remember it was me. He goes on to verse 11. He says, remember it was me. I destroyed the Amorites as Israel advanced his height. Hmm. It was as the cedars. And he said, as sturdy as the oaks, I destroyed the fruit above and the roots beneath. And I brought you from the land of Egypt and left you 40 years in the wilderness in order to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised you up, some of your sons and prophets, and some of your young men as the Nazarites. In this, not the case, Israelites, this is the Lord's declaration. Israel had completely disregarded all that God had directed them to do and not to do. But this wasn't something new for Israel. At Mount Sinai, as Moses was on the top of the mountain, the people had not seen him for days. So they decided amongst themselves to say, let us make gods who will take and us and go before us. This choice, even after having been miraculously delivered from the slavery in Egypt, walking through the Red Sea, having manna given to them and water from the rock, they still had forgotten the goodness of the Lord towards them. Afterwards, God still in his love for them begins to take the people through the desert to the land that he had promised them. As they were about to enter into the promised land, having taken them through the desert for 40 years, God knew their hearts. So now that we see three times in the book of Deuteronomy that God warns them about the forgetting the Lord our God when you enter into the promised land. The first one we see in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 9, it says this. Only be on your guard. Diligently watch yourselves so that you do not forget these things that your eyes have seen and so that they do not slip from your heart for as long as you live. Teach them to your children and grandchildren. Something that we were mentioned last week during the baby dedication. Hmm. Something we should teach from generation to generation. Second, the second time he talks, he goes to this in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. He says, it shall be that when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give you great and godly cities, you which you did not build, the houses full of good things, which you did not fill. The sisters dug out, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. You shall eat and be full. Verse 12. Then beware, lest you forget the Lord. Who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him only. You shall cling to him and take the oaths by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people you are around. Third time that he mentions this about remembering is Deuteronomy 8.10. And he says, when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord. Your God for the good land that he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. To beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God. And disobey his commandments and regulations and decrees that I am giving you today. 
For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and your gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at this time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he has led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes, scorpions, where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with the manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and to test you for your own good. He did all this so that you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth on my own strength and energy. Verse 18, remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant that he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. This is how strongly God felt about telling them to remember. He was setting them up for success. He was setting them up for a place that, uh, 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 again, that was going to cause them to prosper. For everything that they were lacking in Egypt, he was now going to bring in abundance to them. But taking them through the wilderness, he knew their hearts. He knew, again, how trustworthy they could be. He knew where the attention and the affection of their heart would be. So he tested them. He wanted them to understand again. This is so that way you continue to prosper. But the key was they had to obey. They had to stay faithful. They had to remember. It wasn't the point of... I'm waiting for God to do this. No, God already was doing it. God already had done it. But now all they had to do was their part, was to stay faithful, stay obedient, and to love the Lord. As we know, Joshua and the people of Israel went in, went in and conquered the land. Soon after settling in the land, Joshua died. God had placed 12 judges as those who would save them from their enemies and would lead them back into the presence of God. But even then, the people failed to remember the goodness of God. And we can see this as we look at the story of Gideon. In Judges 8, 33 to 34, it says this. Soon after Gideon's death, the Israelites turned their backs on God. They set up idols of Baal and worshiped Baal Barith as their God. Then Israel, the Israelites forgot that the Lord was their God and that he had rescued them from their enemies who lived around them. Today, just as we have read that Israel was preparing to enter into the promised land, to receive all that God had told them that he would be theirs. And to establish him in the land that once belonged to their enemies. In this season that we are in, according to God's plan of salvation, as we are preparing to enter into the promise that God has given to you and I in this church. I believe that this is the same message to not forget our God that is vital for us today. We are some forgetful people now. Come on. Let's tell the truth and shame the devil today. We can't even remember where we've placed our keys. We forget birthdays, anniversaries, paying bills. We forget to call someone back. We forget to buy milk. We forget to pick up our kids from school or our spouses from work. We forget to do the laundry. We forget to clean the yard. We forget to pick up the mail. We forget to cook. We forget to walk the dog. The list can go on and on. But you get the picture. We are some forgetful people. And we forget the things that are tangible, that have a physical presence. How can you think that we couldn't forget about God? 
who has no physical presence. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about like, oh man, I forgot that there was a God. No, what I'm talking about here is forgetting the goodness of God that is done in our lives. How he has delivered you, how he has set you free, how he has he heard your cry. Who was it that was there when you cried and you were in need of finances? When you needed a job, who did you cry out to? When there was a healing in the family or in your own personal life, who did you cry out to and who was there? It was God. Remember, it was me. I've been there. I've never left you nor forsaken you. But it's not the same on your part. You forget about me. You forget about what I've done. How I've loved you with an everlasting love despite your sinfulness. Come on now. Let's be truth. And the Bible says that a man who has no sin is a liar. And as God tested their hearts, he knows our hearts. He knows exactly what lies in between here and here. But yet he continued to love us with an everlasting love. So how can we forget him? I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea how. When we allow our busy schedules, the attractions of this world, our personal goals, the politics of this nation, obligations, when these things and issues, along with other matters, when they become more important than God, is when we address these things first and more often than we do in our time with God. That is when God's placement within our lives begin to fade from the forefront of our hearts and minds. And if we're not watchful, God can be an afterthought. Oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot to pray. I forgot to go to church. I forgot uh, this, uh, but you sure remember the sale over there at Macy's with 10% discount. Come on now. Come on, the smiles on your faces, even the mask, you can tell by the eyes. I'm telling you this because, again, it's the reality of where we are. We have to understand the season that we're in. We're praying for revival. We're praying for change. You've heard the heart of the pastor that God wants to bring healing. But what good is all this if we forget who God is? If we continue to walk in a manner that we think is right. And you know what the Bible says about that? There's a way that seems right to a man. But you know what that leads to? Death. Bible tells us not to lean on our own understanding. Don't try to live life like you think it should be. That moment that Jesus died on the cross was the moment that we gave ourselves up. Because the Bible says we were bought with the price. So we are not our own. So we can't go and walk this life like thinking that, oh, I'm going to do how I feel today. I'm going to live my life and serve the Lord how I think. I'm going to interpret this how I believe. No, that's not how it works. People don't, you don't invite people to your house and let them do what they want. I'm going to open the fridge. I'm going to go lay up in your bed. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to borrow some of this jewelry. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is my house. You need to do what I tell you if you want to be here. If not, then you can go. You can leave. If we have these principles within our lives, how come we don't abide to the principles that God has for our lives? Hmm. 
We have to understand the times that we are living in. We have to understand what God desires to do because life does not depend on us. Life is according to God's timetable. We're not in a place where we once were as far as not talking age, but in God's timetable until his coming. Because that time is coming. Our hopes and our dreams is Things change. Things prosper. We once become, a, 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 once again, a, a, a place of prosperity and peace and joy. But if you read your word, the Bible says it's not going to be that way. The things are going to get harder. Things are going to get tougher. But that's where even more so God's spirit strengthens us. Where we can say that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That I don't have to worry what comes against me. Though 10,000 on my left and 10,000 on my right, I still will be standing. Why? Because God is with me. Why is God going to give us strength when there is no adversary? When there is no opposition? But he gives us so we can stand in that place. For if we can fight for what it's right. You've heard the testimony this morning. How in a place of, of worry... And fear. But it was overcome. Because of the presence of God within their life. To say hey you know what. I am still going out. I am still going to do these things. That should be our position. In this place in this time. Not worry about the condition of the nation. Not worrying about the circumstances of this epidemic. And let me be clear about that. I'm not saying no shots. No masks. Just do freedom? No. The Bible says to be wise. To be wise. So that is what we're called to do. To walk in that wisdom that God would give us. To be careful. But yet that should not keep us back from being the men and women that God has called us. To not take opportunity of times to come together as this. To visit. To call. To share. Your faith with others were the places that you would go. But we allow sometimes these circumstances to hinder us. We begin to be complacent. We begin to feel comfortable. We begin to feel in that place that I'm okay. My little circle is all right. But God didn't call us to be our own. This is why it's important that we remember. When these things begin to happen in our lives and God begins to fade, we find that we find ourselves that we have beginning to blend into society and to the situations around us. We be becoming part of the whole. And the Bible says that should not be so. The Bible says this. That he tells us to come out from among them. To be ye separate. The Bible says to be holy. For I am holy. The Bible tells us this is not our home. So we shouldn't put stakes in it. Put stakes in it, that was me. I just want to be clear. So Pastor Paul said, the Bible says don't put stakes in this place. <laughs> I hear Javier's laugh, so I know what kind of stakes he's talking about. <laughs> Mark 4.19 says this, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires of other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. 
that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and desires for other ch- choke out the word. Choke out what God has placed in your life. What God has, has uh, um, I mean, done since the moment that you were born. From the moment that you were conceived in your, one, your mother's womb, uh, uh, it says that we were wonderfully and fearfully made. To me, that tells me that everything that is in there, from your laughter to your joking to your, 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 the, your, your, the way that you process your thinking, your actions, all that was conceived in your mother's womb. God uniquely and wonderfully formed you for his honor and for his glory. And you see, when you look at the life of Amos, he, was, he, he wasn't raised up a prophet. Do you know what he was? He was a farmer. He was a farmer tending to the fields, cutting the weeds, pulling the crops. But yet God saw him fit to be used for his honor and glory, just like you here today. God sees something uniquely and wonderful in you that he desires to use you for his honor and glory. Right where you are at, God has a call on you. God has a call on you. And this is why we press through the situations that we face. This is why we continue to to stay faithful to God. It doesn't mean perfect. Does not mean perfect. And I need to make that clear. Because if not, what we allow is we allow the enemy to come in and bring guilt and shame. I couldn't serve the Lord. I faltered. Man, I continue to do this. That's not it. What God calls us to do is to be persistent. It says the righteous may fall, but they get back up and keep on going. Persistence. That is what God is calling us to do. Pressing through. Continue to walk. In a manner that brings him honor and glory. He understood that there would be faults. He understood that there would be times of shortcomings. But what he didn't want us to be in is in that state that we find comfortability in that stuff that we're doing. That it's okay. I know God will forgive me. Uh, you know, it's who I am. It's what kind of what I've always been. We can't be in that way. Because as we continue to do that, if we're not careful, God will be a distant memory to us. We'll forget about what God has done. We'll forget about who he is. Again, not that there is not a God, but we'll forget that who he is and what he's done. You see, God loves us enough that he is not going to leave us in the state that we're in. But he will continue to, to, to show us, to bring correction. Psalms 23, thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. Why? Because that's correction. Bible says that God chastises those that he loves. He brings correction to them because he desires to see the best in them. He desires to see again what he has created within their lives to come to flourishing. But he will bring again remembrance. He will bring you to a point where again you'll have to see yourselves of where you're at. In Revelations 2.4 the Amplified Version says this, But I have this charge against you, that you have left your first love. You have lost the depth of love that you had for me at first. See, he sees the heart. There's another verse in the Old Testament that says, that They worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
See, it's not a show for people that are here. Because when you come here, in reality, it's just you and God. Just you and God. The person next to you may be dancing and spinning. You could just be sitting in that seat as quiet as a church mouse. But God's here to meet you and that individual. And this is a place that we come and we say, God, this is where I'm at. The Holy Spirit will again show you where you are. He will show you the, the wrong places. He will show you these things. And I'm not here to tell you these things to condemn you. But I'm here that again you would grasp this. And understand when these points in time come. God loves us enough that he wants to take us in a direction. That will continue to bring him glory. That's why he saved us. He didn't save us to come and sit in the pew. He didn't come and save us so everything in life would be better. He saved you and I because there's others out there that are dying that used to be you and I. And he desires to reach them with the purity of the gospel that can be brought forth in the lives of you and I. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So how do you figure they taste? It's not like Costco. Little sample sales. Come on, I, 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 you guys smiling like I know you guys make a couple laps. <laughs> Just saying. But they taste the goodness of the Lord to you and I. And it's not sitting there giving them the, the, the six points of salvation. It's them seeing the glory of God upon your face through the circumstances that you stay faithful, that you in, in the adversary, that you in the adversity that you face, that you're immovable. That when it comes time for a question, why? You know why? Because it's my God. My God. Not a God, but my God. The God who knows my name. Who knows my heart. Who loves me despite my own self. This is the God that I serve. That when they see and taste, then they'll want. See, my wife used to work at Costco. So we go take the kids when they were small. Now they go on their own and do all that. But when they were small, we'd go and take them and we'd get to her and be like, get this over there. That's where it's at. That's where it's good. It's on sale. I'm like, all right. So when they taste and they see that God is good, hey, you know what? You need to come to church. That's where it's at. All that you need is right here. Well, you, it don't matter, God has it for you. Just come. But this can't happen if we're forgetting who God is. If we're living in a place of complacency. God goes on in Revelations 2, 5 says this. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And there's, a key, there's three key components in that verse. That when we find ourselves in that place, we need to remember, we need to repent, and we need to redo. Remember, repent, and redo. That when we find ourselves into that place, and you will... See, because when he's talking to the church of Ephesus, he's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the church. He says, I know these things that you do. You hate this and you're doing after this. You check this and do this. But you know what? I've got this against you. You've lost your first love. You see, we could still be in the church doing the things we do and lose our love with God because that's what's most important 
Everything flows from that love of God. This is why Peter was always saying, I ask if Brother Luis can come up. This is why Peter was always saying that he was always ready to remind others because people tend to forget. In 2 Peter 1, 12 to 13, it says this. It says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it's only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. You see, we always will need to be reminded, even though we already know. We cannot, we cannot allow our love for the Lord to slip we must continually maintain our intimacy with God through prayer, through the word, and through worship. We have to remember his goodness towards us and not forget our first love. I'd like, you to, I'd like to ask if you would mind bowing your heads this morning. As I was reading this chapter of Amos, actually the book of Amos, again, it reminded me the great importance of not forgetting who God is. That what God has done, how God has been, in the moments of loneliness, Remember, it was me. In the time of need, he would speak to my heart. Remember, it was me. When I felt that nobody was there, remember, it was me. Remember, it was me that delivered you from that bondage just as he did from the people of Israel. Remember it was me that walked you through those dry times in your life. Remember it was me you called to and I answered. Remembering. Remembering it was me. As I had mentioned, I believe truly with my heart, this is what God wants us to do is to remember. Each and every one of us here this afternoon has a unique story, has had an experience with God that no other has had. And though we get busy, those circumstances come about. My prayer is that we would remember that we not allow that first love to wax cold. that we do not stay in that place of complacency. So this morning, I, 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 just, wanna, I just wanna pray for you. But before I pray, I, I ask that you just take this moment as the music softly plays and, and again, allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to let you see where you're at, to let you see the temperature of your heart towards God. To let you see again 
Have I forgotten him? Am I just doing works and I forgot about him? Have I not been pursuing that, that intimacy with him, that, 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 that time in prayer, that time in worship, that time in his word? Have I allowed the busyness of life and the things around to choke him out? Father, this morning we just we just stand here, my God, with our heads and hearts bowed to you. There is nothing that we can say or do, my God, to differentiate from what you see within our hearts which you know that lies within. But Father, we ask you, first of all, that we do recognize, my God, there are shortcomings. There are obstacles, my God, that we have allowed to be in our lives. <laughs> things my God that we've allowed my God to take place of you busyness whatever it may God be God we recognize this Father so we come before you in brokenness asking you to forgive us Lord Forgive us, my God, again, at any point in time, Lord God, that we've put you second, that we've neglected, my God, our time with you, our intimacy with you, where we have placed other things above you. Forgive us, God. We ask you, my God, that you will apply that grace and mercy and love upon us God that as the psalmist says my God that you would create in us a clean heart Holy Spirit we ask that you would lead us and guide us to redo those things that we first were doing in our love for you. That you would strengthen us to pursue you, your face, Lord, with all that we have. Lord, I just pray right now upon the hearts and minds of your people that you do not allow the guilt of the enemy any shame any conviction my God to hinder Lord God what you are desiring to do in the lives allow my God the breakthrough let there be freedom of heart of mind, let their joy be unspeakable, God. And Lord, I just pray that you would meet them in that special place. Just as you met with Moses, meet with them, my God. Encourage them and love on them, Father. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Can go back to the beginning. 
can control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is a place where you promise to be. I'm not enough unless you come. Would you meet me here again? All I want is all you are. Would you need me here again? As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping a shadow In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough Unless you come Would you meet me here again? Take these last few moments and lift our hands to heaven. And worship the Lord. Give him thanks and give him praise. Would you meet me here again? Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come home. where you're at in your own words just take this last moment to give them thanks whatever the lord may have spoken to your heart today would you just take a moment before you leave and interact with him regarding what he's spoken if you've forgotten the lord in some area of your life perhaps you've forgotten that he's with you and he's for you He's never left you nor forsaken you. It's never him who leaves us or forsakes us. It's us who leave him and forsake him. And it's, it's God's has purpose today to remind us that he's with us and he's for us. And if we just turn our hearts back to him, if we just turn our hearts back to him, he will bless us and he'll, he'll release and restore and heal and do whatever it is that he needs to do in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But if you need healing right now, would just take a moment and say, Lord, I, I need healing in my soul, in my heart, in my body. 
we well, just take a moment and ask him what do you need today do you need do you lack wisdom the apostle james said ask he gives liberally of that wisdom perhaps you need wisdom in your life whatever it is you need god can supply grace mercy he could supply your need today thank you jesus thank you jesus we thank you we thank you we thank you we thank you we praise you thank you for your word today lord seal it in each heart may we never forget you lord you always remember us and we thank you for that and so receive the pastoral benediction today from my heart to yours May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May he bless you indeed, enlarge your territory, that his hand be with you, that he'd keep you from evil and allow you to cause no harm for his name's sake and for his glory. May you shine the light of his glory brighter than ever before as you go out throughout this world. May you always keep God before you. May you always remember him. Remember his sacrifice, his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness towards you in every area of your life, that he might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we say amen. God bless you. I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day and a blessed week. Enjoy your Labor Day. <laughs> be blessed in Jesus' name.
Let me speak.